<laughs> yeah, yesterday, two games. Uh, won both of them. So, hey, Frank, how are you? Boys yeah. lacrosse, the 12 year old that's I'm coaching that team. Now, my daughter's playing lacrosse now, she's nine. <laughs> the girls lacrosse, a little bit slower game. Right? But you're right. Oh, yeah. They have some outrageous. Yeah, it was really good. Yeah. It was a fun night. Everybody had a great time. I didn't play lacrosse until I went to college. The only uh, yeah. thing yeah. that yeah. I heard was there wasn't enough food. She played everything. <laughs> <laughs> I was defense. But, you know, it wasn't really a I want the girls to be able to, you know, check a little bit more accessible. I, I think it was really <laughs> logistics. You know, like, like, you know, like, you know there's really not a facility there that you can do. So, I was trying to get a table to play. Good morning, folks. We're going to get started. Um, sorry we are running a few minutes late. Uh, but we'll make up for it in the agenda. Everybody who's down just reduce their presentations by about 20%. Uh, and so uh, uh, we're going to get right um, to the agenda um, after we do uh, some introductions and so I could acknowledge that a quorum is present. So, uh, Jean? Yes, Jean Garan, member of the council. Who have I? Catherine Salasolia. Graduate Mark representative, sorry. <laughs> Mark Maloof, undergraduate representative. Mm -hmm. uh, John Corrado, council. Frank Trotter, council. Scott Middleton, Alumni Association. Fred Walter, Senate. All right, well, the council members all recognize uh, a quorum is present. Uh, so let's begin the meeting uh, like we always do at the Pledge of Allegiance. Mm -hmm. I'll ask my dear friend Lou Howard to read us. <laughs> Our Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And like we always do, we'll do a moment of silence for all our men and women overseas in the military, especially those who've lost their lives. Thank you. First item on the agenda is the uh, uh, minutes of February 14th, uh, 2012. So we've all had a chance to review them. Entertain a motion to approve motion by made. Frank, seconded by Jim. Mayor Barat. Uh, <coughs> any comments or questions or revisions or additions? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion carries. Uh, chairman's report. I got a very, very limited uh, report. Um, uh, other to, uh, than to say um, that the uh, second round um, uh, funding, uh, Governor Cuomo announced last week for the Regional Economic Development Councils that both Sam and I sit on, <coughs> and uh, we're looking forward to another competitive uh, round, another good opportunity uh, for some of the projects that we got approved last year, perhaps to assist them and get further funding for them. Uh, if you recall, a lot of the projects also included Stony Brook initiatives, uh, so we're excited, excited about uh, competing in round two and look forward to that, and I'll brief you uh, at future meetings because probably by the time we have the next meeting is about the time decisions will be made uh, on the second round of funding applications. Um, but other than that, um, I really have nothing uh, to share, uh, and so I'm going to go right to our President, uh, Dr. Sam Stanley, uh, for his report. Well, thank you so much, Kevin. Um, <coughs> so we have a lot of exciting things happening. Um, I'm going to show you a video in just a second, um, which uh, will cover some of the things that I would normally cover in my report. It's a video that we made for the uh, uh, Stars of Stony Brook Gala that summarizes kind of the past year. It's only seven minutes long, I think, so I promise it's not too long, but I think it's actually uh, really good. Um, and it's kind of something we may use in the future when we have opportunities to promote Stony Brook commercials on TV and so on, obviously it would have to be a little shorter, um, but we will find ways, I think, to utilize it. Um, but let me tell you about a couple other things, and we'll, we'll finish with the video. So, um, big news, of course, is commencement. So, uh, on Friday, May 18th at 11 a.m. at Kenneth P. LaValle Stadium, uh, all members of the council, of course, are invited. Um, some of you may actually be uh, walking at that, and let's congratulate Mark, who will actually be graduating. <laughs> Um, it, it's really going to be hopefully a great day. We had we're having six thousand three hundred and seventy-two students will be graduate uh, receiving a degree from Stony Brook, so that's uh, fantastic. Um, we expect more than three thousand to be there at the ceremony, uh, along with of course friends and 
and family, and of course we're hoping for, for good weather, which you know the past couple of years <laughs> have been good. So we'll, we'll keep our fingers. Well, last year was only about what ninety five degrees. That's yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, 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 which, well, maybe we'll work on some fans. It's better than rain. Yeah, exactly. It's better than rain, though. Exactly. Um, we will be uh, issuing honorary degrees to four individuals, and I just wanted to mention them, and they're they're in my report. But Glenn Dubin, uh, who's a Stony Brook alum. Uh, who's been a very generous supporter of Stony Brook University, recently donated uh, uh, $4 million roughly um, to create the du Dubin Family Center, essentially, for athletics, so uh, a strength and conditioning center. Um, <coughs> professor Richard Gambino, um, who's a former uh, professor at Stony Brook University, who's gone on into industry and had a very successful uh, career as chairman of the board of uh, Musa Scribe Technologies. Uh, he'll receive a Doctor of Science degree. Sister Margaret Ann Landrys, who some of you may know, who is a former chaplain of the SBU Interface Center, uh, will receive the Doctor of Humane Letters degree. She's someone who did, did great service to Stony Brook, but also had tremendous service around the world internationally before she joined Stony Brook University. We're very proud to support her. And then some of you may know James Salter, um, the author, one of the leading novelists of the 20th century, actually, is going to receive the Doctor of Fine Arts degree uh, as well. And so all these degrees will be awarded uh, during the uh, main commencement, with the exception of Professor Gambino, who will receive his at the doctoral hooding ceremony that we do for graduate students. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention uh, uh, very quickly is that um, we filled an important position at Stony Brook University, and that's Vice President for Research. Uh, ben Shao, who is a professor and chair of Stony Brook University's chemistry department, uh, a very distinguished researcher, a member of a AAAS fellow, Association for the Advancement of Science fellow, very high honor. Uh, is going to become our new Vice President for Research. Uh, ben will bring tremendous energy and experience to that role, and we're very pleased that he agreed to accept it. Um, that was a national search, by the way. We had great candidates from around the country, um, but Ben really rose to the top as the best. Um, and then some of you may have seen on TV, we started a major advertising campaign um, for Stony Brook Medicine. Um, I actually, I was home the other night and my son was watching a, a game on TV and said, Dad, there's an ad for Stony Brook. So, <laughs> so why is it Stony Brook Madison? The idea is based on the, uh, the power of an idea. If you remember the original tagline for Stony Brook uh, Medicine was the best ideas in medicine in our new campaign. And I see Ken there, very like a proud parent um, for this. And <laughs> the previous one was the best ideas in medicine and now we morphed that a little bit to the power of an idea. And it talks about ways in which the ideas that come from Stony Brook University are changing people's lives and, and and really making a difference in, in the treatment of disease. And I think that's a, a very strong campaign and we look forward to continuing it. And then today, uh, I wanted to remind everybody, and some of you I know are going to this, at 4 p.m. we're gonna do the ribbon cutting for the Lewis and Beatrice Walker Center for Physical and Quantitative Biology. And this was a, uh, sponsored by a major gift to the university by Henry and Marsha Lawfer. Um, it's gonna be a, a really cutting edge center. Ken Dill, a member of the National Academy of Science, was recruited from the University of California, Berkeley, to run this center. I think it's going to help put Stony Brook on the map in a number of ways, and we're very excited about the opening of the physical plant for this today. Work has already been going on at the center, but now they have a home, and uh, Barbara Chernow and her team have done a great job working to get that place renovated and ready for this dedication, and, and we're all very excited about it. Um, and I think I'm probably going to, uh, to stop at this point in time, and uh, I don't think there's anything else I want to say, and let's go ahead and uh, roll video. So. And how far you've come by remembering where you began. And few have come as far as fast as Stony Brook University. Over 50 years ago, who imagined that a small teacher's college on Long Island would become a powerhouse of innovation, an incubator for achievements that impact the world? And Stony Brook's momentum is stronger than ever, fueled by incredible generosity from those who recognize our potential. Now it is my honor and great privilege to announce a remarkable $150 million gift to Stony Brook University from Jim and Marilyn Simons and the Simons Foundation. No place is closer, I think, to both of our hearts than, uh, than Stony Brook. The funds will build an eight-story life sciences research center that will transform biomedical education, biomedical research, and clinical care. With this gift, I hope to see Stony Brook continue to strengthen and broaden and be all it can be. 
The generosity of the Simons gift is accompanied by another milestone, SUNY 2020. New state legislation that ensures our university of long-term stability and growth. We have a new financial plan, that's SUNY 2020. A new financial plan, a new tuition plan that will have the financial security and success of not just Stony Brook, but all the SUNY systems. Because of SUNY 2020, we're going to begin the process of hiring a number of new faculty to come to Stony Brook. Eventually, we're going to hire 250 faculty over the next five years. It's fantastic. And I think that process, that bringing this new human capital, these amazing scientists, teachers, researchers to the university, I think is going to reinvigorate everything we do. Among the great minds joining Stony Brook are Dr. Vincent Yang, a world-class cancer specialist, and the equally gifted Dr. Yusuf Hunan, the new director of the Cancer Center. Another exciting development is the collaborative union of all healthcare programs under one brand. Brandy campaign is a way to get us all to pull in the same direction. The clinicians, the educators, and the researchers under one banner, Stony Brook Medicine. Our momentum is fueled by Stony Brook faculty, who are among our nation's most accomplished individuals. The most important asset of any great university in the world is its intellectual capital. My office and I are dedicated to bringing stars to campus and to retain the shining stars that we have. Stony Brook University is an amazing place, already known for its pockets of excellence. This is the place where Paul Lauterberg invented the MRI that touches the lives of so many every day. This is the place where John Milner has received uh, the Abel Prize in Mathematics, which is the equivalent of uh, the Nobel Prize. This is the place where we mentor more high school students for the Intel and Siemens Science competition than any other academic institution in the U.S. And in fact, uh, we have this year's top winner. Brookhaven National Laboratory is a crown jewel in our own backyard, working together with one of the most major national labs in the Department of Energy in this country, we can shed light into science, engineering, and technology. Further east, Stony Brook Southampton continues to excel at nurturing creative minds with a nationally acclaimed arts curriculum, as well as providing an ideal environment for our marine sciences program. And this year, the Stony Brook Center for Communicating Sciences, led by founding member Alan Alda, received national attention for its initiative to make science easier to understand. Stony Brook is shaping minds that will shape our future, and that extends beyond academics to activities that cultivate lasting friendships. And an incredible new hub for student life is on its way. We're going to be opening the state-of-the-art recreation center. I think one that's going to become the destination for students on our campus is going to help their physical well-being. As students become alumni, Stony Brook graduates carry our legacy into the world, and they make us proud. One of our alum, Mark Bridges, recently won an Oscar for costume design for the movie The Artist. Stephen Mackey won a Grammy Award this year for Best Classical Small Ensemble Performance. Another one of our alum, Major League Baseball pitcher, Joe Nathan, donated a substantial sum of money this year to Stony Brook to build a new baseball field. Another growing story in our legacy is the athletics department. We have a lot going on at Stony Brook, and athletics is just the front porch to it. We are a dominant institution on the East Coast, and we're going to be dominant nationally soon enough. We have tremendous coaches and even better student athletes, and at the end of the day, we have great leadership. I think we have a lot of stars within the athletic program. Lucy Van Dalen's a star student athlete, track and cross country. She's our first ever NCAA national champion. This year alone, we won four conference championships to date. Men's soccer, American East Conference Championship, Women's Cross Country, American East Conference Championship, Big South in football, and of course, men's basketball, regular season champion in American East. Every kid in this community wants to be a senior. This has been a transformative year for Stony Brook University and a momentous time in our young history. A time that has revealed what we are capable of achieving and how quickly we're moving towards the achievements that lie ahead. A time that has strengthened our momentum, propelling us toward becoming one of America's top 20 public universities. A time when the support and involvement of those who believe in our potential is more important and more appreciated than ever before. We know how far we've come. Now, how far will we go? That is fabulous. It certainly uh, makes you uh, feel proud to be 
affiliated and associated with uh, this institution and all the great things uh, that are going on and all the great people uh, that are part of the Stony Brook team and family. So, uh, great job. Thank you. Thank you. And obviously, to the number of people who work to put that together. But yes. I, I just have to say that although we get the reports about the progress and everything, to see it come like this in a flash is something to be really proud of. And I thank you, Dennis, because I heard, I understood every word you said. You know, <laughs> <laughs> you know I know that that was uh, very good. You are so relaxed out there in Ken. And uh, honestly, I think we're going to get your autograph when we leave here. <laughs> good stuff. Uh, any questions or comments for Sam and his uh, president's report? Um, hearing none, uh, we'll proceed with the agenda. Thank you, Sam. Uh, next, <coughs> we have a presentation from Susan Bloom, uh, our senior counsel in charge here on the open meetings law requirements for college counsels. Good morning. This will hardly qualify as a presentation. It just qualifies as some, uh, an update on the change in the law. Whenever there's going to be a change in the law that affects this council, I'll come to you and I'll explain to you what it is. This is a change, a modification in the Freedom of Information law. And since the Freedom of Information Law and the Open Meetings Act do apply to this council, um, I'm here to tell you what the bill says. Now, the, this uh, change is effective immediately. And it, the impetus for it must have been that uh, when a council or another entity discusses a document, a change in policy, a change in regulation, in a public session, um, people who are watching may feel that it's a little out of, con the, the viewing of that deliberation is a little out of context. So what the legislature did was enact a provision which said that if somebody sees on the agenda that there is a document that's going to be discussed at an upcoming meeting, they may request it in advance. And if that document would otherwise be subject to the Freedom of Information Law, we would be required, to, to the extent it was uh, feasible, to give it to them in advance. And the other um, change in the law is that if you have a website and uh, you are dealing with a document that will be a public document and you put it on that website, then those who would attend the meeting can view the document in advance and not have to make a Freedom of Information Law request or a request for that document. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a process, it's a slight process change which um, sheds more sunshine on the process and enables people to see the documents that you're deliberating over in public session. That's it. Are there any questions? Can you give an example of the type of document you're talking about? Sure. Um, so today you'll be discussing a student code. And so that was on the agenda that's posted on the website. If someone had come to us in advance and said, um, can we see the document that you're going to be deliberating over, we would look at that document, determine whether it would have been subject to the Freedom of Information Law, and then give it out. So that would be the type of Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? That's it. Thanks, Susan. And remember, our members, you know, all of our meetings are webcast, and, you know, um, we pretty much uh, do everything. We're very open, uh, transparent process, um, but, and we'll comply with any changes in the law. So uh, thanks, Susan. Uh, next, uh, we have a presentation on the Middle States uh, Commission on Higher Ed, uh, the, self, the self study process. And I think we have Dr. Charles Robbins and Dr. Daniel Davis making that presentation. Yes, thank you. Good morning. Uh, I just uh, wanted to first just thank you for giving us the opportunity to let you know what's going on with the, the Middle States Review. Um, what I'm going to do this morning is just walk you through where we are in the process and, and it's a three-year process going forward, um, but just so you have an understanding of, of where we're going. So throughout the United States, all higher education institutions are required to be accredited. Um, the country is divided essentially into six regions, and um, each region has a separate accreditation body that is required to, to um, do the accreditation. So, we fall within, within the Middle States Association of Colleges and Schools, and as you can see, they are responsible for, I'm sorry, Carolyn, sorry, you know, they're responsible for all schools that, that fall within Delaware, D.C., Maryland, New Jersey, New York, Pennsylvania, Puerto Rico, and, and the Virgin Islands. 
So it's it's really just a matter of, of geography, which association is, is going to be accrediting you. They accredit us. They um, are required to visit us at a minimum of every 10 years. So this is a this is a 10 year process that we're going through. The last visit was 10 years ago. It's a three year cycle in terms of the self study report and that's what we're, we're working on now. Um, Dan Davis and I are, are the co-chairs. Um, Tanjanita Johnson and, and Marsha Pollock from the Provost Office are the associate chairs. And we've tried to, to put together um, for the planning committee a, a really representative body with input from um, the University Senate and, and both undergraduate and graduate students, East Campus as well as West Campus, and really try to be um, as broad uh, in the representation as possible. And what we're trying to do is to come up with a comprehensive self-study. So this self-study will cover um, all aspects of our enterprise. So undergraduate education, graduate education, professional education, um, medical care, healthcare services, and it covers all sites where we deliver services. So it's here, it's, it's Southampton, it's Stony Brook, Manhattan, as well as SUNY Korea. And as a matter of fact, um, Middle States representative will be going to SUNY Korea in the next week or so to, to really look at what we do there. Many of our professional schools are already accredited by their own professional disciplines. So the medical school recently went through that. The engineering school just went through ABED accreditation. Nursing just went through in the last week or so. Um, while that's important information for us to, to report, the reality is, is that middle states will do their own accreditation. So they don't accept that as being sort of good enough. They went through that already. So we can build on that. And clearly, we use a lot of the information that was pulled together for those visits already. But we still need to do do a separate um, accreditation of, of the entire enterprise. All of the reports that, that we give them need to be evidence-based and, and data-driven. Um, they're not interested in what we're, to, to use the phrase that they use, what we're going to do. Um, they want to know what we've done and, and we need to be able to prove that in fact we, we have a track record with that. And it's much more rigorous than in the past. As, as you all know, um, higher education is coming under a great deal of scrutiny. Um, the, the federal government is looking at it, the public is looking at it, so the accreditation bodies are, are under a great deal of pressure to sort of pick up their game also. Um, and close to 75% of the institutions surveyed are required to submit some ongoing monitoring information. So recently both Cornell and Princeton uh, went through middle states and were required to, to have to provide additional information after the visit. So what's the, the timetable? As I said, it's a three-year process that we're engaged in. It started this past summer, um, and we went through the, the Self-Study Institute that we were invited to um, down in, in Philadelphia. Um, we put together the, the steering committee the, the, um, with the input of, of many of the groups here on campus, and of course the, the president and the provost. Um, we've come up with a self-study model, which as I mentioned is, is a comprehensive model. Um, we have put together a draft of the self-study design, um, which is now being reviewed by both the president and the provost and will be submitted to middle states by the end of this week, which is our plan for self-study. We have a visit scheduled toward the end of May where our, the vice president of middle states, who's our liaison, will be coming up to spend a day and a half with us. Um, and hopefully he will at that point approve the self-study design plan as we've laid it out to them. Going forward, um, beginning in, in earnest this fall, uh, we will be having a structure, and I'll show you in a second what it is, of six working groups that, that will be working throughout the, the course of the academic year. Um, they will be involving the entire campus community um, and submitting ongoing reports to the steering committee. Uh, Dan and I have done uh, close to 25 separate presentations at this point around the campus, just making sure that everybody knows what we're involved in and, and what this process is, is about. Uh, by next winter, uh, at the end of the fall semester, Middle States um, should have chosen the chair of our search at that point. Um, we have some input in, in terms of at least 
saying what kind of individual we want. So we want, we'd like somebody from a major state university, from an AAU university, um, from a university that has a, a medical center attached to it, so they know many of the issues that, that we're dealing with. And, and all throughout the next academic year, we'll be working on our, our self-study document, um, as, as well as getting ourselves ready to, to submit that the, the following year. So in the fall 2013, um, so a, a year from this next fall semester, we'll be submitting our self-study report. Um, we'll continue to, to finalize it here, work on it. The evaluation chair will come and, and visit us in advance of the whole site team coming up. Um, and spend a couple of days with us and go over the, the, the review. We will then submit our final self-study report at least four months prior to the self-study, and then the self-study team um, will actually be with us the spring of 2014. And I know that may seem far away, but it will be here before we know it. Um, and they will spend a, a, around a week with us, depending on, on certain issues. Um, they will then submit their report, we have a chance to respond, but only in terms of, of factual errors, if they, if they actually got something wrong, not their assessment of, of our programs. Um, they will then submit that to the, to the commission as a whole. Um, the commission at its June 2014 meeting will review um, our, our, the self-study report as well as the report of the evaluation team. Um, we will have a chance to have some representatives there, both from from the president's office, but also the group that worked on it in, in case there are issues we need to respond to. And the commission will then um, take their action, hopefully to, to give us the, the full 10 year accreditation. <coughs> the bottom line is what we're trying to do is to really create a comprehensive culture of assessment um, that looks at the 14 standards of excellence that Middle States um, has issued at the same time, they're very concerned that everything that we do emanates from the mission of the institution so that we're consistent with what we say we're doing and, and why we're doing, I'm sorry, why we're doing it. So we've created a, a series of six work groups that again, we're looking for volunteers from faculty, students, and staff to be a part of. The, this work will, will take off in, in, in earnest come the beginning of the fall semester, but we were just talking to to Fred Walter before the meeting that, that we really want to start thinking of names of individuals to, to, to really do the, do the work on these committees. So standard one is, which will be our first work group, we'll look at our mission and goals. So it's really very basic, who does the university, university serve? Um, what is it that we're intending to accomplish? And, and can we, do we use our mission to, to get us in that direction? The second group will look at three standards, so it's planning, resource allocation. Um, are we really using our, our resources in a way, again, to support the mission? Um, do we use assessment to make sure that we're achieving our mission? Institutional resources, again, it's, it's do we have the resources that we need to, to do to carry out our mission, um, and are they appropriated, appropriately distributed across the board? We're, we're given these 14 standards, and they apply to different institutions in different ways. So the way in which they're, they're grouped here is, is meant to be a Stony Brook appropriate uh, grouping of them uh, under individual working groups. And standard seven, which is one of the standards that many, many uh, institutions have difficulty with, is, is overall institutional assessment, and that will really look at um, how effective are we in, in achieving our mission, and how do we use assessment to really know where we're going? Mm -hmm. And so that's a ma going to be a major focus for us going forward and really making sure that, in fact, we're, we're able to answer that. But standard seven and standard 14, which is, which is student learning assessment, are the two standards which, which the most institutions that have issues have issues with, so, so we're trying to pay a lot of attention to those. They, they deserve a lot of attention, but they're also great tools, because mm -hmm. they're, they involve assessment, they address some of the things that the university leadership want to do to turn use this process as a means of continuing to assess where we are, not a, a one-shot process, but part of a continuing process. It's, it's
it's really important to us, to both Dan and myself, um, but also the, the president and the provost, that, that this be not just a process to, to, to meet the needs to, to get reaccredited, but in fact, this is really a, a genuine process that we're engaged in um, to really look at where we are as an institution and help us to really get to the next plateau and, and, and really be, be able to achieve the goals that, that we have set forth. So working group three will look at, at three other standards, the leadership and governance, um, to really understand our governance structure and, and all the different constituencies within it. Um, the role of administration, how that facilitates education and research, <coughs> knowledge development, and, and how do we support our governance structure. And then the issue of, of integrity, which is its own standard, but, but we've said in our planning committee that we want each and every work group to look at the issue of integrity because we think it rolls out in everything we, we do and we, we believe we need to be able to say that um, very clearly within, within the self-study document. The fourth working group will look at, at student <coughs> admissions and retention as well as student support services. And again, this is um, not just undergraduates, this is graduate professional, these are students on East Campus, um, to really make sure that, that we're, we are consistent in how we do this, that we're bringing in the best students, that we're giving them the tools that they need so that we can retain them, so that they achieve their, their learning, um, and that we have uh, in the classroom and out of the classroom the kind of support services that are, that are necessary to, to achieve that. The fifth working group is standard 10, which is our faculty, which is really, again, and you heard Dennis mention this in the video, is how do we bring on um, world-class faculty and at also retain those who we have? Do, do we have the resources to do that? Do we give them the support that they need in, in order to be, to, to be effective in those areas? Do, do our existing faculty have the resources they need to be able to engage in teaching, research, and knowledge development? And then finally, um, the last working group um, is going to look at, and this is a, a, a pretty broad area, but it's, it's all of our educational offerings. Are we offering the courses that make sense, not only the courses, the educational programs, that make sense to, to again, support the mission that, that we have in terms of education? Our general education program, um, which is uh, required of all of our undergraduate students, and this is one area that we are um, in the process of changing right now, so, so we will, will shortly have a new gen ed program. So this is an area that we won't have a very long track record on, but um, we'll be able to present um, why the changes that are in place were made, um, and then we'll have to be able to show them how, in fact, it's been rolled out. Our related educational activities, which is really everything else that we do other than the traditional degree program. So any certificate programs we have, um, ongoing um, professional education, um, but also how we support students with, with, with a variety of learning needs. Um, do we do experiential learning? Do we do distance learning? Um, and again, how the core standards, our core mission is, is, is consistent throughout. And then standard 14, which I had already alluded to earlier, which is what are our expectations for student learning? Um, what, do, what is unique about a Stony Brook student when they complete a degree program here? Um, how do we know that, in fact, they're achieving that outcome? And it's really, um, again, this is, this is something in, in terms of a, a culture of assessment that, that we need to, to start at, at the, the day a student arrives and then carry through all of the programs uh, going forward. And, is, is one of the areas that, that we know requires a great deal of attention from us. So those are the 14 standards. Um, we believe that we've set up a process where, where we'll be able to really address these over the next two years and, and put us in the position two years from now um, to receive the full accreditation from, from Middle States. And with that, we'll thank you and see if there are any questions. Well, no, very impressive, uh, yeah. folks. Um, uh, Luke? It's just one observation, and, and it's not something I would propose, but there is a difference between legality and accreditation. In other words, a school could operate as long as it had a charter and was legal. But uh, accreditation is something that the institution chooses. Uh, 
how they want to handle it and to whom they would look for that accreditation. But it, uh, a lot of people do not understand that you could, probably at a lot of uh, Bible schools and so forth, don't want to have the uh, problem of having to go to laws that uh, don't agree with, with them. But, uh, there's no question that any institution like this certainly would not be doing anything for doing the best accreditation they could. But it is interesting that you can be legal uh, and, and not be accredited. But I, that's absolutely true. Um, <clears throat> but part of what we get from being accredited is, yeah. is access to a lot of federal funds yeah. and federal that's research that's dollars that's and, no and, and other things that we wouldn't have if, if we were not in fact accredited. And plus there are also students who may not want to come to a school that's not accredited. Without a doubt. <laughs> Correct. 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 So yes, uh, there's a student here and then, uh, sorry, I go with Catherine. Catherine, yes, I'm sorry. Um, what do you see the makeup of the different working groups? So I'm assuming that one member from the steering committee committee is going to chair each working group. Is that correct? So that at least one person reporting back. And then in terms of student input, how many students do you see? Is there going to be students on every working group? And what length of time? What type of commitment? So as we're starting to think of right. possible people, right. we. Um, the, the, one answer is there are going to be students on every committee, and I think that's critically important. Um, so Mark has been on our planning committee, but he's graduating, so he's leaving us flat at this point. We can always no remorse, right? Things can be done. It's still time. Right. Um, but the reality is, is, is that we, we would like to have students who can commit at two years at this point um, going forward, so we can go through of the, the next few years of the process. And we've spoken with both Mark and Harris in terms of, of, of trying to come up with people for that. Um, so there are going to be students on each committee. There's going to be students, the continuing students on, on the steering committee. Um, each of the chairs of the work groups will be on, on the steering committee, as, as you su suggested. And the rest of the, the group will be made up of, of, of faculty, students, and staff, so that, uh, just across the board. And just uh, like you said, it's important to get students from East Campus as well. So Absolutely. medical students, the only thing is, I think second year student, current second year students or rising second year students, first years, uh, at least for the medical school, would probably be best because they'll have some experience with the school. But then it might har be hard to get them for a two year commitment because then in the third year they're going to be going to their clinical rotations. Right. So. Um, Dr. Kashansky has appointed um, Dr. Chandran to represent the, the East Campus Stony Brook Medicine on our planning committee. And, and so she has been talking at, to the medical school, but, but also the other schools in terms of getting some, some student representation as well as faculty representation across the board. Jean? Yeah, uh, just a quick question about Korea. Uh, this is a very intense and highly focused group that you're, will you have the same kind of group or will you have a separate group over in Korea and does Korea have an accreditation system that would supplement or be equal to this? The second part, the second part of your question, I'm honestly not sure what the answer to that is. They, um, our, our understanding is that they are going over to Korea at this point um, simply to see that the courses we're, we're offering there are consistent with the courses we're offering here. Um, so that they're of the same quality, they're of the, the same number of hours, the same number of credits, um, and, and they will then, the SUNY Korea program will then be folded into our accreditation the way all of our other programs are. So it's not going to be a separate accreditation, but it's going to mean that we're allowed to offer classes there and, and, and give credit for the, the work that's done there. But would you have representation from Korea as well? I mean... I don't... I think that's something we'll have to talk about. It's a very good question. I think as far as accreditation in Korea, you know, one thing that's different between many countries in the United States is in many countries, the federal government of those countries actually takes a very active role in higher education, and that's the case in Korea. So the Ministry of Education and Science and Technology, MESC, uh, actually was engaged in the process by which we founded SUNY Korea, mm -hmm. and a member of MESC sits on the board of SUNY Korea LLC. So they're actively engaged. So that really serves as kind of the accreditation process, is the paperwork and the things we had to go through in the reports, and their actual presence on the board of the institution serves that. So there's not, a, to my knowledge, there's not a private accrediting group as we have here where Middle States is a separate entity. Rather, it's the responsibility of the government essentially to provide that kind of accreditation for the universities. 
So I, I just wanted to, uh, you know, say, I think you get a feel. This is a tremendous effort. Um, it is a tremendous right. effort. It takes resources. We're going to be hiring people to help us do this. It takes time from faculty. It takes time from students. It takes time from staff. Um, and leading it, as Charlie and Dan have agreed to do, is, uh, is, a, is a tremendous responsibility, but also something we're very grateful for both of you for doing. This is not an easy thing to do. I, just so, so we understand, um, the boards, the accrediting commissions have gotten very demanding. Uh, and I would argue, and we're on the record here, but I, I'll, I'll say it in public, um, <laughs> I, would, I, would argue, I would argue sometimes over demanding not always rational in their requests. And I'm going to give a, a public example, which was, which is out in public, which was Princeton University, um, who I think most of us would agree here is one of the finest uh, institutions of higher education in the country, actually received a warning um, from middle states because they weren't satisfied with the honors thesis that people do as, at Princeton as a mechanism for evaluating student performance. Um, if you know, so if you just start to get a feel, and if you think about the breadth of education that's off there, you have for profits that are offering education, you have many, many small schools. I think it's very important, in, in my mind, that the accreditors focus on the areas where there's major issues. So, you know, at Stony Brook University, we're certainly going to benefit from having this self study, and we look forward to learning from the accreditation process, but I think it should be a reasonable process and one that recognizes fundamentally the missions of the institutions involved and the outcomes. So it's not an overall type of grade to get your accreditation. So if you have 99 programs or uh, areas of study that are you know, terrific, and one area of weakness, that one area of weakness can hold up the whole accreditation? Well, you know, I'll let the people who have been to the training more, but I think that there can be warnings, there can be things yeah. you have to do to correct, but probably in that case it would not stop the completed accreditation. You would have things you would have to address in subsequent years. They will identify areas. Gotcha. I don't know what their terminology is, what their... They will, they will require us to, to do interim reports and on those areas that they're concerned about. Is so that their actual terminology areas of concern? Sorry. Yeah, because they have different accreditors right. have different terms. So areas of concern is there. So they'll identify areas of concern where we need to work on. And, and we will have some. I'm, right. I'm, I'm sure we will. Um, most places do. It's hard not well, to. With the size of this university, exactly. I would expect this too. Yeah. So is this the first time you said we've done this in 10 years? And right. Has the process changed a lot in the last 10 years? Yeah. And uh, yeah. any issues that came up or areas of concern 10 years ago, have we addressed by now? Great question. Absolutely. The, the report 10 years ago, um, and, and I was not a part of it, actually Peter was a part of it, um, Rather than doing a comprehensive review the way I've described it here, we did a focused review on our undergraduate experience. Um, so it's a very different kind of, of, of self-study. Um, and our, our goal is, is to really go back to the review that was done 20 years ago, which, which was a, a more comprehensive review of the whole institution, because we believe that, that we've gone through a lot of growth and a lot of changes, and it's important to be able to to really analyze that and, and, and look at that. Um, so we, we have looked at the old documents, they've informed what we're doing, but, but between the, the changes in middle states as well as the changes in the university, this is really going in a very different direction than, than the university went 10 years ago. As, as a former department chairman, I can tell you two words that throw fear into your heart is middle states <laughs> examination. And everybody has to build as a part of the unit and dovetail it all together. It's very, very complicated. All right, but that was three words. <laughs> <laughs> that probably wasn't a nice remark. You made. <laughs> <laughs> all right, any other questions? Yeah, at, at minimum, accreditation aside, it sounds like a very healthy process to learn what's working well, what's yeah. not working, things that need to be addressed, so uh, it should be valuable in a number of respects. Yep. So look, we look forward to updates from you guys in the future. Thank you. Uh, they, oops. I have a, actually a question to Miss Blum, if it's not, if it's okay. Um, under the new open meetings law requirements, would a PowerPoint presentation suffice as informing the gallery, or would hard copies still need to be printed? So in this instance, a PowerPoint presentation was made. Is that okay? Um, if somebody requested the document, we would give them the document. We could also post a PowerPoint presentation okay. on our website. So either there are different mechanisms for compliance with the law. Okay. Is, is that answer? So, so the keyword, in, it would be in advance, it would have to be offered. 
I'm sorry? It, it would be offered in advance, is that's the new requirement? That's correct. Okay. Or it, it's, it's available in advance if requested. Thank you. Okay, we're going to continue on with the agenda. And we'll get an update on some uh, safety projects um, from Barbara Turner. Now, remember, folks, you know, again, our roles are statutorily limited um, in, uh, in terms of the council, and but one of our roles is um, overseeing traffic safety issues for our students uh, on campus. And so I assume that we'll be getting some type of update from Barbara on Perfect. those issues. Yeah. <laughs> okay, now there is going to be an exam, so you should take notes. <laughs> but we're first going to start with a uh, little gift, because I believe you all will pay attention. If you do well, there are others. <laughs> and especially you, Fred, because I know you're a big bike rider, and this will be very important. Thank you. Okay, so let's celebrate safety at Stony Brook. Um, this is just a list. It's not an eye chart. We uh, have 40 <laughs> initiatives that um, we started. Frankly, in 2006, we hired an engineer to help us with some uh, traffic safety initiatives. And I'm proud to say that more than 70% of them are now complete. The red are the ones that are completed. The initiatives are both on campus that we do ourselves and then off campus when we work with uh, local government agencies. <coughs> so, the, if you can't see that, there are some maps that you can pass around too, Fred. Let's talk about on campus. So, the pink are the completed ones, as it was in the other chart, and what did we do? Well, we realigned roads, and I'll show you some of that in detail later. We put up new lights, which is interesting in that we created a lot uh, more lighting all over campus, walkways, sidewalks, garages. Yet our consumption for the lights we put up, um, all that gave off more light, lowered our consumption because they are the new technology. We've also worked with um, radar signs that show cars their speed. That was, had a big impact in lowering speed. Even Chris lowered his speed. <laughs> <laughs> And um, we'll just, I guess, continue, and I'll show you some of the details. Okay, so celebrate safety. Sam was very clever. He said, as you're doing this, let's uh, have some apparel, and let's get students involved. So the cards that we're circulating are some of the ones they came up with. The vests, um, actually, I saw a student, Sam, last week on Nichols Road, wearing that vest, riding their bicycle. That's great. Good. And um, later, if you turn the lights on, you can see this, actually. Um, mm -hmm. Quite visible. And then in our bookstore and our SeaWorld's market, those are a lot of safety items that you see on the right. All right, let's go down uh, memory lane, shall we? The old main campus, the photo to the left, you probably all remember, you had two intersections when you came in. So when you came in off Nichols Road, you had an intersection here, and if you wanted to go in Badman, you had another one here. Actually, you had a third one here if you're going in the garage. So needless to say, we had many, many accidents there. So that was the first road that we realigned. And you can see the current main entrance on the right, Minim uh, limiting the number of intersections and making it a lot easier to navigate getting into campus. Then we had an old T intersection at Marburger and Circle. That's also on the left. And um, we were planning on doing an improvement to that T intersection. But I met with a lot of faculty, and they came up with a great idea. They said, how about a roundabout? Yeah. So on the right is the roundabout now, which is fabulous in that it improves traffic, the congestion is minimized, and getting on and off campus at 5 o'clock is much, much easier. Uh, this is Toll Drive. We have a master plan that we will beautify and make a very pretty pedestrian plaza. But I didn't want to wait for that. Our bus drivers no longer wanted to drive on toll because students were working and not paying attention. Not you, Mark. You were okay. <laughs> so Lou and I didn't do that because you don't see that right now. But we put bollards in where you see them at the edges. So after the student rec center is completed and the arena is started, we're going to uh, dust off the design and then do some construction to make that pedestrian plaza not only friendly but beautiful. And you can see at the bottom left is our new food truck, a little ad for Faculty Student Association. This is a uh, food truck that's very popular on campus, right, Lynn? Delicious. <laughs> <laughs> okay, then the north entrance. That was number four on our list. So when you were coming up north entrance, you had um, a very interesting time in that you couldn't see to your right or your left. So what we did is we moved the new road closer to the new baseball field 
And now there's no uh, guessing about whether a car is coming or not. You could actually see. And the top picture shows some of the landscaping we're doing. And John Credo knows this very well. Uh, working with students yet again, we came up with a new system. Students said that they had a need for speed and they didn't want to wait in the rain for the bus. And could they get a real-time tracking system? So working with our College of Engineering and faculty at CWIT, we designed it ourselves. I showed it to John. I think it's better than any commercial product you could buy um, on the market. We have 25% of our fleet already uh, geared up with the hardware. The remaining will be done this summer. And if you want to catch a bus later, you can just see on your phone where it's going to be. Okay. Yeah. That's great. Yeah, students love it. And it really not only will be a service for students, but it will help us manage our ridership and then manage our routes and then hopefully uh, our consumption of fuel. Barbara, can I just jump in? Two yes. really cool things about this system. I brought my whole staff and we're very impressed. We've seen these systems. We use some of them ourselves. Um, first and foremost, you design it yourself very cost effectively. And um, without getting specific, these systems are millions of dollars. And uh, I know we've done with staff time. I mean, that there's some cost to that, but uh, much reduced cost. The other thing is that uh, this was designed as only a university would design a system uh, to last for many years, and it's really a module, so uh, pieces of it can be pulled apart, uh -huh. and uh, it won't have to be thrown out, which is unlike what you're going to buy in the marketplace, because I think technology, as we all see, is built to be yeah, uh, outdated, like uh, you know, months after you buy it sometimes, but these systems are very expensive, and uh, I know Barbara was talking to Suffolk County about possibly in integrating some of this into uh, what they're doing. But uh, very impressive, of course, you know, Barbara does and her entire staff, everyone uh, very keyed in, Stan. Uh, you know, I spent the day on campus and it was really uh, a lot of people firing and all cylinders, as you would expect. So very impressive. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Okay, then this is a bit more challenging. This is the safety improvements we're doing off campus, working with, um, as I said, local agencies and getting approvals and trying to convince people to do this is a little bit more challenging. But County Exec Alone has been fabulous. So the first thing we asked for was countdown pedestrian timers. So at these three locations, when you leave campus and you'll see our Nichols Road, when you now want to cross over Nichols Road, there's a countdown timer. In addition, um, I asked if we get the speed limit lowered. It's now 55, cars usually do 65 to 70. Yes. I asked for 45, we're still working on it. But what the county exec did do was immediately dispatch their uh, traffic enforcement folks. So this started at the end of January. On average, they gave out 100 moving violations. Uh, County Exec was sort of happy in that his revenue spiked. <laughs> <laughs> and I just spoke to Regina Cocteria yesterday, and last week they gave out 15 moving violations. So their revenue is down, but I think traffic enforcement has really made a very, very big difference. So we're hoping to do the same thing on Stony Brook Road, the green on the left. Um, we're working on trying to get more lights. Um, the other thing I did with the town is this intersection that Sam told me about, the pedestrian timer and light was not very effective in that it was about nine seconds. So the town now made it 17 seconds and they're still monitoring it, but hopefully students will be able to cross yeah. around Mount um, Quaker Path a lot better. Yeah. Okay, things that have happened, the countdown timers on Nickel I told you about, the traffic signal at the new Thai restaurant I told you about. We're still trying to get sidewalks on Stony Brook Road and better lighting, and those are two views of Stony Brook Road. Many of our students walk there, and frankly, um, it's dark at night, and there's really no place to walk. Um, the other thing we're doing with the County Sex Office is beginning May 26, we have a partnership now with Suffolk County Transit, and I think it's just fabulous. We're going to save money in that we're not going to send our buses out on Saturdays. Because we were sending our buses, the county was sending theirs at the same time, well, actually more frequently. But now we're going to not send our buses, we're going to save money, we're going to pay the county because they'll pay for the ridership of the students using that system. And now students could off campus go to Port Jeff or the mall, and I think it's a win win. We're very excited about that. Okay, that's the end of traffic safety. Let's talk about personal safety. In addition to SB Alert, which you know most universities have now, God forbid there's a an emergency, and we have to tell people we could text them, we could email them, and that's what most schools do. But we came up with something new called, um, what we call the personal blue light phone. So anybody with their own cell phone now can program it 
so that if there's a panic mode, if you wanted the police to come, you just hit the button. And then there's a precautionary timer mode. So if you think it takes you 12 minutes to leave your office and get to your car, you could set that. And when you get to your car, turn it off. If you don't turn it off, that could mean that there's a problem, so it immediately rings to the police dispatch. And some students are taking advantage of that. Lots of staff are. And um, I haven't done it yet, but maybe I will. And maybe I'll forget and embarrass myself. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you'll, run but this is so people, you'll run into too many people on the way. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right, yeah. Um, lab safety. We have updated our policies. We have 40 new training modules on Blackboard. We created a lab safety council, which now helps us do our inspections and our mock audits. And I really believe this is having a major impact in uh, lab safety. And I know Dennis has been very involved and has encouraged faculty to be part of this. When we went to Southampton, I think it was sort of a wake-up call. So we're now um, really, really pushing the lab safety, and I think it's important. Fire safety. Um, after the tragic fire at Seton Hall, uh, New York State law changed in that we have to immediately ring out our alarms to the police station, which then uh, rings it out to our volunteer fire departments when an alarm goes off. So as you can imagine, the volunteer mm -hmm. fire departments felt it was a little burdensome on them. So after three months of saying, okay, enough with these fake alarms, but there wasn't fake alarms, the alarm really did go off. Uh, Shirley Kenny funded a 24-7 fire marshal program. <coughs> so we hired fire, fire marshals that <coughs> round the clock are on campus, and they're the first responders. The volunteer fire departments in the county were very appreciative because it really cut down on the times they had to come to campus. But we've been tracking those times and working with the fire departments. And in the slide, I'll tell you about something new we've done. But we're continuing to reduce our fire alarms. We are upgrading our systems in that we have voice capability now. So in many buildings, if there was a fire or some other emergency through the fire alarm system, we could talk to people in the building. And we continue to upgrade our systems and inspect them. And this is, I think, one of my favorite slides, because this shows you how dramatically we've impacted and reduced the number of fire alarm activations. From 2009 to 10, it was 15%. From to 2011, it's 25 The slide on the right shows how often folks from the fire department actually came to campus. So in 2011, for instance, although there were 499 automatic alarms, the fire department came to campus 76 times. Now we've changed the rules again working with um, government in that now if the fire alarm rings twice, two separate ringings, then we tell the volunteer fire department. So Peter, I think the um, troubles we've had with the fire departments are now over in that the alarms are really going to go down. Wow, that's amazing. Any questions? It's amazing, amazing what you've done in a short time. It's a, a, a long process, I'm sure, but especially with the fire department, because I know they do react. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, there's two million square feet of residence halls. And yeah. Somewhere around, what, well, there's about $11 million of investment in, that, in the systems. So these are big scale investments yeah. in trying to manage student, student safety, because you really want the fire department to roll if you've got a fire. And right, and not, not cover, because they've had some other alarms. And we still have many dorms with um, kitchens in them, so it's very, very, very important. How many different fire districts does the campus sit in? Three. Good question. We, uh, the R&D parks are at St. James. Uh, Stony Brook Fire Department has the lion's share of our residence halls. And Sadaka has some, and then many of our buildings. But our relationships with them is really now A+, plus because yeah. we worked with them on the things we've done. We've engineered our new systems. We've uh, promoted education. And it's been a partnership. And with the enforcement, Peter could talk to you later about when students have un unintended cooking issues or some other <laughs> bad behavior. There's a discipline part, uh, process. OK, so there's a short, um, short essay on fire safety. If you do well, you can pick up a shirt or a fire safety book on your way out. Uh, <laughs> Thanks, Barbara. Thank you. Good job. Very good. That is that being involved in the fire service. That's something I've heard since you know for years about the relationship between yeah, the, the university and um, mm -hmm. and the fire departments with regard to false alarms or you know them them showing this up. This university or all universities? No, this university. Yeah. So uh, and I can also tell you that I've heard the opposite. You know that the progress has been made. I wasn't yes. sure what the progress was, but. <laughs> 
it's a lot better, and thank you. Right, and I think next year the numbers will really show yeah. dramatic improvement. Great. Thanks, Barb. All right, continuing on, uh, we have some new business. Uh, there was a proposed revision of the University Student Conduct Code. If he calls again, he's going to have to tell us who it was. That's something pretty important. This role is more important. Um, so, uh, we're going to have a uh, presentation by uh, PETA, uh, Vision. And uh, again, one of our other roles here as a council, any type of change to the student conduct code. Uh, requires a council uh, action item. So, uh, Peter, let us know what it is uh, you're presenting and uh, the action that you need us to take. Okay, thanks. Uh, um, this is the annual update of the Student uh, uh, Conduct Code. Um, if you remember in the fall, we had an interim, uh, in October, we had an interim update that was a function of OCR's uh, changes uh, through its uh, dear colleague letter. Uh, these rules cover all students, undergraduate, graduate, and professional, and um, have a review process that happens each spring, and I'd like to have Maddie Bunnett give you the details. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Peter. Uh, the University Student Conduct Code was established to set forth standards of conduct for all of our students, undergrad, graduate students, and professional students. Um, after a thorough review of the Student Conduct Code, we have identified changes in language and content. We are proposing these changes be included in the code for further um, to further clarify university processes that are already in place and to further ensure the health and safety of the university community. These changes are a result, again, of OCR guidance regarding Title IX, State Fire Marshal, and the Office of General Counsel recommendations. And you do have the grids with those proposals um, in your packets. The group that reviewed the changes was comprised of members representing various areas of campus, including the Office of University Community Standards, the Office of Diversity and Affirmative Action, the Dean of Students Office, Academic Affairs, Undergraduate Student Government, Graduate Student Organization, University Police, and the Division of Campus Residences. In closing, we hope that you are in agreement with the few changes and additions we are proposing. And if you take a look at your grid, the changes that we are proposing um, are on the right-hand side, and then we do have some additions, which includes um, information technology. Also, in the same vein as fire safety, we have added um, some extra features for our residence halls, including not having fabrics uh, or tapestries on the walls in the residence halls um, due, to, due to some fire safety issues. And then the last few changes are regarding continued OCR guidance and Title IX issues. Are there any questions? No, uh, Maddie, they all you know, seem you know, reasonable changes and we sort of uh, got to defer uh, to you as to what's required of us and uh, in light of that, uh, I'll make a motion to approve, uh, second by, uh, uh, let's get a motion on the table oh, yeah, and a sorry. question, uh, seconded by Frank, uh, question on the motion. Yes, um, I guess the 20%, the that's the total surface area of the entire room, Include so both Roommates will only be allowed to use, I guess, ten percent each. I think it's twenty percent of their side of the wall, and anything that is in, in encased in glass does not does not apply. So they can have something encased in glass, and <coughs> that doesn't include is not part of the twenty percent. Uh, just thinking about the time spent in the dorm. Um, Laundry. If students are hanging out their laundry to dry, uh, granted it's not on the walls, but it still might be a fire hazard. Or I know some students may hang towels over, you know, a a closet door. Is that considered part of their twenty percent? Or that's a good question. Because <laughs> I mean, that wouldn't cause more. 
I have. Um, Once it's dry, <laughs> fold it and put it away. <laughs> we, <laughs> didn't <get> into the, <laughs> we didn't get into the laundry part. Um, I mean, I don't know what students do here. They might hang up a laundry line across. Who knows? But, um, <laughs> but. Just the thought, something you might want to think about coming we going will, forward. We will, we will look into that. Just the tapestries, yeah, that, because of the mass of the tapestries. That, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. that was something that was brought up. Living in a dorm, I know those things. Well, I don't live there anymore. No. Yeah. <laughs> Any other interesting, questions? Interesting questions. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so there's a motion and a second. Uh, all in favor? Sweet. Oops. It, we have based on his. Is there any way most is there any way to amend this if it really is indeed twenty percent per each student? So either to state that of each side or forty percent total? Or depending on no twenty percent of each side and twenty percent of the total when you have the two. Twenty percent, yeah, yeah, but is it I mean it should be fine then? Regardless? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Percentages are relative. Okay. And Catherine too, you know, um, these, this is a living document that can periodically be updated if we sense something that we have a debate in terms of an action becomes problematic for a student. There's always an opportunity for us to reconsider it and revise it again in the future. Okay. You do review the code once a year, yes. right? In the fall of the year, the new income. I'm going class. to review it again in the fall yes. of this year. Come. Great. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? The motion carries. Maddie, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, any other business uh, any council members uh, would like to uh, raise? There are none. Um, our next meetings, dates aren't set. Uh, likely will be first week of October and first week of December. Uh, but Susan, who does a terrific job, and we thank you for everything you do in terms of keeping us you know, in the loop and uh, the sharing of information and helping coordinate our crazy schedules. Um, uh, we appreciate you, Susan. Uh, but she will let us know, you know, uh, probably over the next 30 days or so, uh, so you can mark your calendars for October and December. Right? Thank you. Thank you. Right. Uh, here are no other new business or old business. Um, motion to adjourn by John, seconded by the mayor, Ron Lou, uh, and uh, wish you all a very happy uh, spring, beautiful summer, and look forward to seeing some of you next week at graduation. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. Meeting is adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. So who's taking over your place on the steering committee? Oh, sure. Oh, it's a good comment.